Hi, I'm Steve Harper. I'm the CEO and founder of Owner Insight. I'm super excited for you to join us for this podcast episode. We're going to be interviewing one of our favorite clients, Bon Secours Mercy Hospital construction team. We've been working with this client for about two years. They are amazing. We've had such a great relationship and I'm super excited to talk through some of the specifics in terms of how they're utilizing Owner Insight, get a background and history of sort of why they see construction project management software, at least focused on the owner as a critical tool and resource for projects of any size. And most recently, they've gone through a audit process that Owner Insight really had uh, a strong applicability towards helping them navigate those waters. And I'm excited to dig in and get to know uh, a little bit more about that and uh, how Owner Insight benefited them. This is going to be a unique episode because we've got multiple members of their team joining us for this call. So, uh, you know, let's get started. Uh, Chris and Molly, thanks for joining me for the Owner Insight Podcast. It's so great to have you guys. How are you? Good. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'm excited about this. We are starting to uh, create some episodes around and featuring some of our amazing clients. And you guys have been, you know, some folks that we really enjoyed working with the last two years. We just kind of looking back and, and looked at all that we've accomplished over the last, you know, uh, 24 months, I'm, I'm just kind of blown away and excited about, you know, the, the relationship we've been able to develop with your team and the approach that, uh, you know, we've, we've taken together as we're kind of creating this partnership journey. And so I'm so grateful to have you on today. I just like, you know, as a good place to start, just to give our audience a little perspective, maybe you could um, just introduce yourself, talk a little bit about sort of uh, what you do day to day for the team and, you know, just a little bit of background as to how you got into this industry in general. Molly, go ahead. All right. <laughs> I love I that. Um, so my name is Molly Ironmonger. I am the system director of planning and pre-construction for the Bond Score Ministry. So that's a big word salad way of saying I get involved very early when somebody has a conceptual idea at an operational level, wanting to add to their, to their physical space, whether it be a new dock office or whether it be a 200 bed hospital system, uh, that we want to build. Um, on the day-to-day -day interaction within our insight, I also have our person that's in charge of our cost accounting and our construction cost accounting that reports up to me. So I support her. So, you know, like I get into the details of what things are wrong and what challenges we have. So I would say in the owner insight, most of the time I'm interacting with where we have challenges and training our new people. So for me, when I, so that's important. And then for me also, I like it because it gives us a good data portal insight to real costs. We struggled before we started instituting owner insight on what were the real costs? What do we actually spend on a project? And if you hear background noises, my office mate is being a little bit unruly. There's a lot of I'm gonna go kick her out in a second. No problem. But we struggled with finding what the actual cost of projects were so that we could then estimate the next one. It, we would spend forever looking through multiple different softwares, trying to understand what we said we were going to spend versus what we actually spent so we could do some real estimating. So to us, that's also been an added benefit now two years in that we're starting to build a database of real costs. And so I interact with on our insight to see what we actually spent, not just what we guessed we'd spend at the beginning. Excellent. Excellent. Chris, what about you? So... Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Kneven. I'm the Vice President of Design and Construction for Bon Secor Mercy Health. So my role encompasses all that we do in capital improvements for designing and constructing across the ministry, which is um, 10 markets and 34 acute care facilities and thousands of ambulatory facilities. And that really makes me responsible for the execution of our capital plan with a team of really strong people, including Molly, our, um, who you've met. So um, my inner, you know, our interaction with Owner Insight really for me has been trying to, to have a, a, a tool to help us really understand and control costs and, and as a primary in our schedule and our documentation. And this is where we brought Owner Insight in. And, and, and I'm really most directly involved. I'm, I'm very much engaged in making sure our costs are under control because it's okay to say we can build something, but our, we're, we are stewards of the ministry's money. So monthly with every senior project manager and director, I meet and go through their cost report to see where we are and that it's up to date and accurate and where we have any red flags or issues. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you. Chris, let me ask you, let me start with you. What, what attracted you to uh, this, you know, as kind of a career path? Sure. 
Yeah, so um, uh, many, many decades ago when I, I decided to get into engineering, I went to school for engineering. And um, when I first started out, I was like, hmm, I don't really want to design things. I love to build things and be engaged in the bricks and mortar and have my hands on this. So I, I went down the path of a program at Purdue University called uh, Construction Engineering and Management. And what that allowed me to do was have half of the engineering and half of the business skills. So uh, I combined those into something that I just have my passion for which is not just to design it, but to construct it and to do so in a, in a cost effective and, and time effective manner. And that's where my passion's always been and where I've been doing for the last 35 plus years in the industry. That's great. Well, in, you know, for our audience, uh, Molly, you may look very familiar because you've been a part of our Women in Construction series, but could you give our audience just a little bit of a brief rundown of what attracted you to this industry? I, I, I sense the Purdue connection in terms of how you guys probably... <laughs> That's not my resume. So this is actually the second um, company or organization I've worked with Chris on. The first time I'm a Purdue human, so that's how my resume sort of was out there. That's awesome. Um, so I started my engineering journey thinking I was going to design cars for women because I am a five foot nothing human and car driving <laughs> is actually very painful. I have a physical therapist right now because I can't drive in a car without it hurting my legs. And then I started going through and realizing I didn't really like hanging out with those people. So I just started gravitating towards the people I liked. And so I ended up in civil engineering because they were the people I liked. And then I started gravitating towards construction because I liked the people. Um, I also was very fortunate enough to be the sorority's president. So I was in this industry to manage people. I love to build things and get very physical myself. I were doing a project edition at our house and I was actually insulating a shower this weekend. So it definitely it sort of blended both the people management that I really love and connecting those people and the the tactile of something real. Like I, I've a couple of times in my career tried to do something IT related and it's just not tangible enough for me. Yep. I sort of get exhausted by only managing the theoretical. So it's very happy for me to be involved with something very tangible and real. And I can say I did that. And it just is a better connection for me than just managing something else. So managing people, managing something that's real. Um, and then I've sort of had the fortunate ability to work on all sides of the industry. And I keep coming back to construction. I've been in real estate development. I've been, you know, owner management. I just keep coming back to construction, real things, bricks and mortar. And then I joined the ministry three years ago, um, working with a great team of people to build something that's really needed. And so I find that mission component adding to the people, building something that's real and building for somebody that really needs something layered together it makes a really good place for me to be. For those that might not be familiar, maybe Molly, you could explain uh, the when you talk about the ministry, could you explain sort of the corporate kind of structure and sort of how this all kind of plays out in terms of all the different facilities and in organizations within that, you know, corporate structure, sort of how that's situated? Absolutely. So we, uh, Bon Secours Mercy Health is a ministry. We were founded by the nuns of Bon Secours and Mercy Nuns. We are a conglomeration that joined together about three years ago, if time serves, it might almost be four at this point, um, working together to bring a bigger ministry perspective. So it allows us to have a bigger um, back support system to help small rural hospitals is where a large chunk of our hospitals are. Um, so we are 34 acute facilities in the states, as well as the largest nonprofit in um, non-public hospital in Ireland. Um, we also have 6,000 points of care beyond those acute facilities. So we have everything from urgent cares, which we are right now in the middle of rolling out an urgent care program, to acute tertiary centers in Richmond. We have the level one tertiary center in, in the Richmond market. So we sort of span the depth and breadth of what healthcare is. Um, being also the fifth largest Catholic healthcare entity, it makes us that we are very large. So cost control and very um, good controls is important to us because it's something that one little project going off basis is a problem. Yep. Many little projects going off basis is a very large problem. Um, and then at a ministry level, because we are a Catholic <laughs> non-health, sorry, <laughs> because we are a Catholic non-profit, non, um, we also, in an interesting fact, report all the way back to the Vatican. So there is some wow. you know, with things like uh, sustainability or um, community involvement or, you know, greater good being in part of the uh, communities that we serve. It's really important. So that's 
another sort of interesting component of what we do. So it's not just like we're building to build, we're building sure. because we're providing patient care at it for those that need those so, that are in need. So with all, I mean, there's that, you know, with everything that is involved, there's a tremendous amount of moving parts relative to all these various projects, right? Cause it's not just, you know, brand new buildings and, and new, you know, facilities that you're building, but ultimately you're maintaining and assessing continually, you know, these, these rural facilities that are probably needing small modifications, renovations, or additions in addition to all the big projects. So how has Owner Insight, Chris, maybe helped you from a kind of a leadership perspective, look at those things from, you know, kind of ticking your box and the things that you love doing and, and uh, helped you sort of hone in on just the, you know, those, those critical areas that you need to be putting your time and attention towards? Sure. Yeah. So Steve, it's, it has been a huge help to us, especially from the aspect of looking at the fact that we typically average about a billion dollars of capital spend a year spread across all those markets, all those facilities. They can range from um, doing a minor renovation in the labor and delivery um, ward all the way up to a brand new $500 million hospital. So really being able to get our hands around that in a consistent vehicle that we can actually, uh, and this is one of the great things I appreciate about what you've done. Your team has been really helpful about being, being able to help us organize and structure it around where we need to be able to look at it. So I know it, it, as, as, as an old guy like me, I can simply click on and get to the right structure and find the right person and their projects and, 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 and really walk through those. It's been very user friendly from that aspect and get right to where I need to go. And I can click on and dive down a little bit deeper when I need to and say, well, wait, why are all these purchase orders here? We can discover issues quickly because of that. So I, I really, it, it gives me a sense of peace in a world of really great complexity um, from that aspect. Oh, that's great. Let, let me ask you like, you know, a non-software related question, but why do you, why do you like what you do in terms of, you know, your day-to-day, -day? what, what, what really attracts you as, as part of this team in, you know, sort of, you know, the, you know, the, the hook that keeps you there. I mean, obviously you both work together at a different location and to land here. Every time I talk to either one of you, you're both really super passionate about what you do. So yeah. I'm, I'm really curious, you know, what that secret ingredient is there. So let me start with Molly on that question. I will say what gets me up in the morning for me anymore in my role is to support our team, our design and construction team. I'm not on the day-to-day -day building jobs anymore. I My job is to, we have a team of ooh, 20 <laughs> plus third parties. So we have employees that are Bon Secours, you know, um, part of our ministry. And then we have a lot of third party people, which also I'll say is this tool is helping us build that consistency for when we bring a third party, we train them and say, this is our way. So for me, it's helping them. I spend a lot of time right now, um, not just planning projects, but helping our processes and procedures. So getting our people and saying, what do you need? And I would say the other one that's really important to me is creative problem solving, which is sounds like vague and, and um, buzzwordy, but you know, we have a problem and it's stuck. I really love helping get unstuck, whatever that is. We had an issue yesterday where we had a roof project that we have $200,000. It's coming in at 900,000. What are some ways that we, we might not get all the way down to 200,000, but what are some ways that we can levers to pull to bring that project down? Um, and then keeping projects moving, I would say at a construction level, costs have gone up astronomically in 2022. Yeah. I think Chris, you quoted 23 three percent last year so how do we design towards budgets in a fast pace because getting them getting hospital operations up faster is important and how do we just keep that driving so for me it's which is also sort of creative problem solving which is yep. total buzzword but to me that's really what gets my juices flowing in the morning well you know it's a, it's a great buzzword though because I, I don't think you know a lot of people really embrace that really unique aspect and it takes a special person to be able to you know to look at those things not as problems, but as opportunities and, and really try to dig in and, and figure it out as opposed to just throw your hands up and go, I don't know, it's somebody else's problem, right? So I, I love that about you. Chris, what about you? Well, for me, Steve, it's, I would put it into two components. One is, you know, after 35 plus years in this business, I'm finally engaged in the design and construction of things that hugely make a difference in the lives of people every day. We're, we are in a ministry of healing and uh, we get a chance to be part of that in a, in a kind of a back of house, but critical way, because you can't do healing without the facilities, right? Right. And so that's been a real rewarding component to me. We give away about $2 million a day of 
for free health care as part of this ministry. That's amazing. And so Molly and I and this team are able to execute that. Now, that's the that's the kind of the altruistic piece of this. The realistic component of that, the pragmatic element of this is that all these years of training, I've I've been able also for the first time to really hand pick a team, those 20 plus people that Molly spoke about, that's come together from all aspects of design, construction and business to really apply all their skill sets, right? And have this team really spread across five states uh, to be able to work together, that, that human part of it for us being able to work and, and pick our partners in this process and then make these, these buildings, these facilities come to life and then see that pointed out to my my adult children or my my spouse and say we did that right and that's important to us that's what gets me going that that's a great thing you know <clears throat> we're doing this series as as Molly knows women in construction and one of the things that has uh, really kind of rang true for all of our guests is is that legacy piece right you know the the fact that you can 10 years from now you know 30 years from now drive by a facility and say i i had a hand in that there's some significance to that and we were we've been talking about through that series how to get more women uh, to look at construction as a career path you know and, and and engage that as a as a logistical you know opportunity to explore as they're coming in you know out of high school into college and so i think that legacy thing can't really can't really be undersold it's such an important aspect I would argue, though, that if you're waiting till high school, you've missed it. Yeah. You know, I also say this is in the trades as well. We struggle from a trade deficit in our industry. Like humans, I use that word a lot, boys or girls, yep. do not think it's a valid career choice, whether right. you come into our side and our management side or the guys in the field, ladies, men in the field, the humans in the field. And so I think, you know, I'm working with one of our contractors. They're starting in elementary school certain wow. to go introduce this as a as a good valid place to be and then that yes they do high school and college and all the other stuff but we're finding that we're needing to go even further down to change the hearts and minds of people so that they find this as a valid valid career path and i will say sometimes i argue my husband's a tech guy and you know that I sometimes say there's more innovation in my world right now than in tech. I would say yeah. tech is sort of saturated with ideas and people that have gone there and it's sort of become, it's sort of crested in innovation. I would say we are ripe and plumb for innovation. So anyone, I'm like, you guys, it's, you don't have to go to college. You can come out without debt and you can go be in a place that's just ripe for innovation. I find it very, a cool time to be in construction. Now cost makes it weird time to be in construction, but there's some elements that it's just ripe and plump for some really cool stuff that the construction industry that we know today is different than when I started 15 years ago. And probably Chris, you could say different than when you started. Very much. And I would say five, 10 years from now, I hundred percent expect it to be different and can't wait for those next five, 10 year increments of just being able to look back retroactively and be in awe of all the stuff that we've accomplished in that time. I love that. That's thank you for that. That's a great, great perspective. What you know, you you talk about the the challenges of the industry. You know, as we came through the pandemic and had all of the challenges that offered. You know, one of the things that we talk to owners about all the time is having that bird's eye view as to what's going on. You guys talked about cost and being in control of those things because those inform so many other areas of the business, you know, if you, if you lose control in one area, it's going to impact several others that could uh, be devastating, but with the economy, the way it is, right. You know, supply chain shortfalls, labor shortages, what, what would you say to an owner out there? That's like, well, you know, why do I really, you know, I'm hiring these experts to manage these things for me. You know, why do I care <laughs> about the, you know, the intricacies? I mean, you, 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 you guys see it day in and day out, but you know, an owner that may just be building a new, you know, a new facility for their company or they're, they're adding on to their campus or whatever the case might be. Why is it even more critical now because of all the pressures you guys are seeing for them to have a, a tool set that at least keeps them in control. Let me start with Chris on that. Yeah, so I think, uh, uh, Steve, you, you raise a great question and a great point here is that in reality, those of us that are owners manage more than just the construction cost on a typical project. We're responsible for construction, uh, design, uh, due diligence costs, um, uh, information furniture. technology, <laughs> furniture, medical equipment. We have all these costs to manage. and, and Sometimes we have better control over their costs, depending on the organization you're in than others. But at the end of the day, somebody's got to pull this all together because the leadership provides a budget for a total turnkey project. And in reality, we are developing this turnkey project. Now, construction's the biggest part of it, agreed. 
But getting our hands on every piece of this was one of the challenges when we first arrived here. Most owners, especially hospital systems, know how to incrementally buy a box of syringes or a, a, a box of sheets, right, for the hospital. But to buy a half a million or half a billion dollar hospital that's built over 36 months incrementally with multiple partners engaged is really not what those systems are built for. So we had to go out and find something that could control that cost structure because we have to have control. That's, that's kind of a key element in our role. Oh, that's great. Molly, what about you? What's your take on it? I would say a hundred percent with costs. I'd say something that we're working on our 2022 was get everybody to get all the costs. 2023 is scheduled. We're also trying to find leading indicators versus lagging indicators. We all are very good problem solvers. We all know how to fight a good fire, but we're trying to not have fires. And so we're trying to find the things before they become things. So we're trying to find costs being the first one that we were trying to catch before the end of the project and we didn't have enough money and have to go back hat hand. We're trying to catch that earlier. We also have had the flip side of we've been able to go sometimes to the ministry in it as you said, economies are very hard, costs are going up and say, we have some extra money on this project that we can safely predict we're not gonna spend here, go back to the bigger pot so we can put other projects back in line faster than waiting all the way to the end of the project. So that's been good. And then we're working on for 2023, rolling out schedule assurances because we're starting to see, we've tracked like beginning of construction, end of construction, and we're trying mm -hmm. to get a lot more um intentional about focusing on milestones because we're seeing a couple projects where milestones start slipping and they assure us that the project's going to end on time and it's just like we know <laughs> as much possible like if you start missing every deadline like <laughs> well we want shame on you we've seen you this guys. story <laughs> yeah. seen this or or quality starts suffering that we can say at the end we're gonna have a punch list a mile long we're gonna have you know stuff falling out of the ceiling when we're trying to put put our first patient in which could lead to a patient safety event which could cause problems so we're trying to again yeah. find those leading indicators and that's what owner insight gives us that view for ourselves and not just somebody's really good marketing ability to tell us everything's fine yeah well you know that's that's the interesting taking you know, when we have conversations with you know potential owners that might utilize our platform we talk about you know the ramifications of what's going on in your project now and how those might you know develop later because talk about you know you know not only the short the supply chain shortfalls but also the labor shortages which means shortcuts are being taken in certain trades right in certain capacities and in you at some point may not see it you know it when the facility is opened or the new project is is sort of you know released into the wild but it might you know develop uh, an issue or a concern you know six months or six years from now and the ability to have that documentation and data as to who worked on what when is pretty key right definitely it is and and, and being able to have it uh, compiled in one location right yep. so we can access it and that's kind of critical and that's what we do like about owner insight also is that we have all these tabs with that data that we can keep in our archive and so so that's a driver for us yeah i yeah. will say on on that one place chris just sort of dogpiling on that steve i know i text you about an audit mm -hmm. we have one audit for who approved pay apps that was an owner insight and we printed off a page and said here you go here's who approved what and then we have one that's in emails and it, that human is no longer with the ministry he is retired mm. and so we cannot find stuff for audits so this is stuff that like lessons learned we now can if somebody is here or they for whatever reason decide to leave the ministry or retire we have one sure. person just leave we have proof of yep somebody acknowledged that that pay application they approved that it was should be paid and so for us being able to compile all of that not in 12 people's emails or somebody's computer drive we have somebody else that also retired from the ministry we can't find documents because they were on his personal pc and mm. we think it's been wiped by now like we started looking for the pc at this point because we are desperate <laughs> yeah and it's on someone's computer not in yeah. the cloud oh yeah, that visibility is so critical and the ability to access it. And that's kind of the thing, you know, that I think a lot of owners don't think through in terms of that process. Um, we uh, we have a common saying around here is, you know, with the, when in certain owner environments kind of like default to, well, you know, our GC is making those decisions or our architects making those decisions. 
you, know, you want to trust, but you want to verify and you ultimately <laughs> want to control. And that's the critical factor is if everybody's putting it in their own little unique, you know, fiefdoms, their own software or on their own, you know, laptops, their own personal, uh, you know, assets, those things aren't directly accessible to the owner in, in, in a time of need, but really even just in the archival aspect of a project. Yeah. We're also um, talking a lot with our we acute facilities management has now come into our real estate umbrella. So we're having a lot of conversations with them of what do you need and how do you want it? Cause we just get that closeout checklist. That's really big, but if it's not in the right format, if it's not in the right location, it doesn't do anybody good. So we've started to talk. So acute facilities, meaning hospitals, places where we find like uh, severe care, somebody that's going to be in for a while versus inventory, meaning, a doctor's office and urgent care and imaging center. So they're two different. We had already been working with our ambulatory center, uh, acute facilities management, our ambulatory facilities management for a while. So now we're working on that acute side. And so that's that for you, you just said archival purposes. We're trying to work with our internal teams because I can't tell you how many times I've shown up and it was just because people didn't go from summer to winter mm -hmm. because the part like, something is wrong. And it's just because they didn't do the right switch that you need to yep. use. In. And that's because we didn't train and we didn't archive and give the information in a format that was consumable by the person at the other end. Yeah, that's really good. Well, you know, let me just ask you this one last question, you know, and I'd love your perspective on both of it. One of the things that we told you on the front end when we first started, you know, to discussing the possibility of partnering here is that we approach everything from a partnership perspective more so than a vendor perspective. And so have we been able to deliver in your, your mind about that? I mean, I know there are certain things we, you want the software to do differently and we are, we don't forget those things. They are, we're, we're still working towards that. I promise. But you know, you guys have been really instrumental in, in helping us look at different aspects to build our future iterations of the platform. But, I, you know, one of the things that I, I it's important to me is to really come across as that true partner rather than just selling you software, because I think that at the end of the day, that's um, you can get that anywhere. Right. We want a different experience. And I'm just curious, you know, your feedback on that. Um, maybe yeah. let me start with Chris. Yes, Steve. So I think that that's that was a differentiator for us in the selection process. I think the two differentiators came down to one, you know, Molly and I looked at, at, at a selection process based on our past history of using several different software packages, more from the constructor side of things. What we realized is that we didn't need all of the elements in a typical constructor software program. It just, and, and you know, you, you're going to pay for that. And we didn't need to pay for those components. What we needed was some strict critical components to be able to control cost, analyze schedule, execute pay applications, you know, control our changes and our RFIs, et cetera. And, and, and so we said, oh, this is great. What we found was by calling some of the other people using our insight was that, oh, wait, you know, they will work with you and, and help. And I thought, well, OK, everybody. <laughs> right. But what we found from my perspective, and again, I'm at a fairly high level. I'll let Molly dig a little deeper is we I have been pleased with um, the, the major components that we've asked for things. Hey, can we adjust this? Can we do this? Because it's really helped me make it more user friendly. And you guys have been cooperative about that aspect of it. So that's been kind of the two core differentiators for us to why we are um, um, really appreciative of the partnership we have with Owner Insight. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I like the word partnership. I would say that's definitely something that we seek in people that even build our buildings, design our buildings. Construction can be very adversarial or just stoic or just everybody has their own swim lanes and we're we like building in partnerships. So, you know, Owner Insight, everybody living in one platform, that's how we operate our projects and so bring in a software partner that sort of has that same feeling if nothing else that we're all sort of in the same boat rowing the same direction is just very helpful to us i will say um there's people on our team angela rakowski that she when she has a problem she calls clayton and clayton yeah. and her now have honestly a work relationship that's yeah. that they understand what each other's are needing and it's very helpful so i would say for us rolling it out we're also lean and mean and tiny. When I said we have 20 people and then I said Chris has a billion people, we'll tell other people in our industry and they think we are joking because they're they have teams of hundreds for significantly less work. Yeah. And so for us it's just also helpful to have that partnership for it's when we are stuck and we don't know how to do it, we we can lean on you guys and, and get help, which is very helpful to our team. Or somebody stuck needs a new training, needs help, it helps us out. 
Yeah, well, we're, we are certainly grateful for the opportunity to partner with you. And, in, in, you know, we value the relationship. And one of the things that we want to do through this approach of highlighting some of our customers, great people that are doing great work, not necessarily just to promote our, our platform. We're lucky. We're the byproduct of that because we get to work with amazing professionals like yourselves. And we don't take the uh, responsibility of that partnership lightly. And so we're so grateful for the opportunity to continue working with you all and, uh, you know, continuing to hear the great ideas and, the you know, suggestions on where to move the platform forum and how to improve it to make your work and your jobs easier. So that's our commitment, my commitment personally, to make sure that we continue to do that. So I just want to thank you both for joining us for the Owner Insight podcast. This has been really insightful to understand a little bit more about what you deal with day to day and your perspectives on utilizing a platform like Owner Insight. And I certainly appreciate it. You know, you know, Chris and Molly, you guys are amazing. And if if for whatever reason you know someone out there in the industry had interest about how you operate and what you do is there any way that you would be open to them connecting with you to, to you know because you guys have some great best practices and approaches and if so how would you like them to reach out to you absolutely absolutely always happy to <laughs> always have to help i'm involved in a couple different groups where we do meet and share and happy to share and and, and get some insights and find out what other people are doing and how, you know, they've helped leverage components of this software and, and um, very much love to engage in that kind of group. Okay. How would they get a hold of you, Chris? Would it be best to do LinkedIn or do you have an email that you would yeah. like us to share? Yeah, you can share my email. Okay. Uh, it's my first initial last name at mercy.com. Okay. Perfect. Molly, Thanks. what about you? Same. I'm Emma Ironmonger, or you can find me on LinkedIn, or if you have a personal connection, always connecting is always wonderful. And so if you hear this and have somebody that you know, um, you can connect. Awesome. Well, thank you both for the time today. I really appreciate you coming on the Owner Insight Podcast. All right. Thanks, Steve. All right. Take care.